Hope everybody's having a good week. Just getting things ready to go here. Thanks for dropping in early. Got to make sure everything's working right. All right, we're going to be starting here in a sec. I think we got what we need. Yeah. I'll see you guys in a little bit. Thanks for joining again. Hello, everybody. I want to welcome you to Compass Games Live. It's episode 64. Tonight is uh, it's August 19th, Thursday night. And uh, yeah, you guess what? You're stuck with me again. I mentioned last week we're going to welcome uh, Bill Thomas back from the for the town hall this week. But uh, he is on a uh, nice, well-deserved extended uh, holiday break. So uh, he will be back next week, which means you're all stuck with me again, which I know is extremely depressing news. But I'll Try to cheer you up today with a pre-order announcement. Usually that seems to work pretty well. 
Um, so that's what we're going to do to try to cheer everybody up that's uh, going to be stuck with me. So let's go ahead and start by uh, just giving a quick update here on the schedule. So actually not too much to mention since our last talk last week. Uh, as mentioned, we've got the restocks are now shipping, Blue Water Navy and Enemy Action Ardennes. So I see a few folks have posted on social media. I've, I've seen definitely some Enemy Action Ardennes uh, pictures set up. So people are definitely receiving the game. Happy to see that. Uh, the big news is on the left side here in the left column. We've got uh, two releases on the 30th. We've got the War Europe reprint restock. And then we've got the new release, which is the War of the Pacific by Ernie Copley. We'll have him on for an episode here in the short term. Uh, coming up for sure, because uh, we definitely want to talk some more about the War of the Pacific with him. Also want to talk with him and revisit how he can link both games together for a huge masterpiece of World War II. Uh, Granada Last Stand of the Mo Moors, you'll see, is listed for September, as well as Kharkov Battles. And then October, same schedule, Russian Campaign, original 74 edition by John Edwards, followed by Gregory Smith's Imperial Tide, the Great War, which we were able to talk to Gregory about here recently as well. Uh, so the uh, newsletter did go out not, uh, last week. We have not yet sent it out uh, for this week. So I definitely am going to be providing an update. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here simply because this is old news for uh, anyone uh, that's aware of it. The only thing I would say is make sure you sign up for our newsletter from our website to get the latest information. Uh, it's worth mentioning uh, the big news is that we have a new Kickstarter. So as you can see here, we've got uh, Kharkov Battles. I'll go ahead and zoom in here make it a little bit bigger. But uh, Kharkov Battles is currently uh, running right now on Kickstarter. It's off to a great start, by the way, almost 100 backers already. Uh, so the elevator pitch on Kharkov Battles, if, uh, if you go back in history and you like the Panzer Group Guderian system, Operation Typhoon, Westwar series, they like to call it as well. Uh, yeah, it's based on uh, basically Fall Blau is a very uh, nice release from Compass. That's uh, it's a monster game. Uh, East Front Monster Game Fall Blau on the drive to Stalingrad. So we're going to be extending Fall Blau as an option. It's not required. This is a standalone game, Kharkov Battles. You can watch the video on the Kickstarter to see the final components. Absolutely. But uh, this is a standalone game based on that system. Uh, has several maps. Uh, it has the extension map for Fall Blau uh, for those that are interested. Uh, there's a bunch of scenarios. There's both standalone scenarios as well as uh, the extension scenarios for Foul Blau. So you can either do it standalone or you could do the big kahuna and combine it with Foul Blau, which, uh, which would be a pretty, pretty cool thing to see set up. Uh, lots of graphics in here, some information about the sequence of play, but rather than look at the sequence of play, I always recommend on Kickstarter, we always provide the full rules. Just click on it and you'll see here, you've got the full rules that you can go through to learn more about the system. Again, for those that are familiar with Fall Blau, this is gonna be really second nature to you. So you're gonna be ready for the system right away. Uh, might be a few special rules, of course, given the situation and the scenarios. Uh, here you can see we've got some Fall Blau extras. So that's to, uh, to uh, update the game. So it's got an updated chart. So there are some updates to Fall Blau if you get Kharkov Battle. So definitely recommend it for that as well. Uh, and then you'll see some additional information. So again, uh, it is a standalone game. That's the main um, main thing I just wanted to mention about it. But again, it's now on Kickstarter. Please uh, check it out. I'll work to get the newsletter out tomorrow. That will be the lead story. It's gonna be about uh, Kharkov Battles for sure. Uh, also wanna congratulate uh, David and Mark over on the Compass Games Enthusiast Group. I always forget to zoom in here, but uh, wow, they're actually approaching 1,000 members now. They're hitting the uh, century mark here, which is uh, pretty amazing because I think they posted a few days ago they were just above 900. Uh, Bill's going to have a special announcement in support of the Compass Games Enthusiast Group, which uh, we're really looking forward to share. Uh, that will be for next Thursday. Bill will definitely be here next Thursday for sure. So we're looking forward to that. But I just want to congratulate uh, everybody over in the Compass Games Enthusiast Group with how they're doing. And what I'd like to do next is I'm showing you a little screenshot here I took last night, which uh, obviously uh, Mo's going to know about. So Mo, <laughs> actually, let's uh, we'll hide the screen for now just to do proper introduction. So thanks for thanks for joining us again tonight. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thanks for having me on, John. 
So we're going to talk about learn to play sessions, which are you're helping orchestrate. Uh, also want to give a hat tip to Jack Stalaka for his ongoing tournament play as well. But we just had our learn to play session uh, last night. I'll go back to the screenshot here just to share with everybody. Could you tell everybody what it was all about, how it went? Uh, just a little after action report, if you will. Sure. It was uh, for hearts and minds. And uh, if there was actually somebody who had just gotten a copy of it. So it was perfect timing for him. But uh, we had uh, Carl from Wargamers Bootcamp. Uh, he came in and taught it, and it went really well. Him and Tim had actually, or actually Tim had actually worked on the module, kind of updating some of the things on the module. And uh, Carl had uh, done the teach, and it went really well. We went for about an hour and 40, 45 minutes, something oh. like that. So had uh, good discussions during and after uh, with everybody, especially towards the end when, you know, everyone, he was asking, does anybody have questions? And no one started talking. And then once one person started talking, everybody started asking yeah. questions and That's created little, some good little, banter. Uh, good give and take a little good. Yeah. Uh, that's always nice to have. That's what's nice. Uh, also about, uh, on discord server, you can have just chat video chat with everybody. Sure. Uh, Carl's here by the way. So Carl, uh, Carl Crater who uh, hosted. So Carl, thank you so much for doing that for us uh we have to find a way to spoil you so we can have you do it again you did a great job i was able to drop in i saw somebody mention they said what there's a vassal module for this what's that about so i guess we dropped the vassal module recently for hearts and minds as well or at least an update uh, yeah there was the kind of a couple updates that tim had done to the vassal module because there's there is an existing one out there and he kind of did a couple tweaks to it so uh i think there he's going to do a couple more things to it i think last night he was talking about that okay. uh, tim can correct me if i'm wrong because i think he may also be in the chat okay, uh or great. if not then carl could but uh and then when that's ready we'll uh post it up there for everybody great and then uh, could you share with us a little bit about um what is in store for the next learn to, or no before i go there i mm -hmm. really need to ask you about people always ask about the recording will there be a recording available of the yep. learn to play session for hearts and minds yeah there's always a recording that'll be available next week i have to uh, edit it and then i'll do like i normally do do some uh you know do some heavy editing to try to cut it down for time because sure. like i said it went about an hour and 45 minutes yeah. so we'll cut it down and then uh, also add any digital assets that need to be added and that way everybody can follow along and uh, get their teach in for hearts and minds and hopefully get to see some people playing in the discord i like that for a shirt get your teach in uh, yeah. i like the sound of that that sounds pretty <laughs> cool so so getting your teach in for september what's that uh, shaping up to look like any any uh, ideas to share with it oh yeah idea? yeah that was uh that one's going to be john southard teaching the conquistadors and that is all bill's doing because bill was like hey i want to get this done i want to make this happen so he contacted me and john and uh, we got it all set up for the uh, september 22nd at eight o'clock eastern time Great. so make sure that you're on the uh, compass discord that night and we'll be doing a teach there's a brand new vassal module that's been done uh, by kevin and he did a great job with that kevin conway did a fantastic job with that so looking forward to that okay great and here's the comment from carl thank you again carl for being here really appreciate it and yeah we'll get that module out shortly uh, speaking of modules uh, i've got a lot of questions uh about um the nato module for vassal because we yeah. used it heavily for play testing but it was sort of a bastardized version of that makes sense it didn't have all the final production graphics that are in the game so i checked in with joel toppin yesterday um things are going well he said he's uh, at a 40 percent completion milestone so he's almost halfway through with the uh, massive update to the vassal module because it's all new it's all new artwork all the counters the setups <laughs> for the mm -hmm. scenarios you know oh, it's yeah. not a not any small task and joel always does a great job so uh definitely uh, definitely glad to hear he's making progress so nato nato module uh, vassal is is in the works and we'll definitely release it as soon as uh as soon as it becomes available and then uh, any problems with it or from playing we can get joel to update it in case we miss anything so looking sure. forward to that well, yeah definitely looking forward to that <laughs> thank you again so much mel really appreciate you, you stepping in with us and thanks for helping uh introduce carl to learn learn to play because carl does a great job with the uh, war game boot camp and it's great that we could have him do a learn to play for us so big mm -hmm. congrats to you and, and really we, we appreciate all you do mo uh, sure. for us and for the for the hobby so thank you so much no problem. Have a great night, have John. A good night. Take care. Bye bye. All right. Actually, I did forget to mention a few things that I want to mention also is uh, we do have our August summer special still going on. So I did not want to be remiss in not mentioning that. So let me just go here and share my screen again. It's on the news page. So if I scroll down 
I'll just go to the actual uh, blog entry here. So we have these five uh, titles available for another 10, 11 days or so. 11 days, I think it is. So uh, again, check them out. These are the five titles. Just click on the news link on the Compass website and uh, there's no coupon code, nothing crazy like that. You just add it to your cart and you'll get the savings that you see listed on this page. So we have, uh, thanks to everybody who's uh, definitely ordered uh, and taken advantage of the summer specials we do. This will be the last uh, special offer that we are gonna be doing because we've already started work on our annual uh, winter catalog so or you know whenever it's released late fall uh, winter time frame so that's that's our huge uh, you know centerfold fold out uh, catalog of gosh I don't know how many titles it is now and uh, I've been working with uh, the compass HQ on some pre-orders that we haven't announced yet that have to absolutely be in the catalog because the catalog is going to be out there for about four or five months. So we have a lot of stuff uh, being added to the catalog that we have not talked about at all yet. So just want to mention that. Also, I uh, just want to give a quick mention as well about uh, our Compass Games Expo. So again, we're up above 50 early registrations. If you go to our website, you can get information about it by just clicking on the uh, expo link. We've got the uh, signups there, the attendee list. I will have to update it for the past week. I have not had a chance to update it, but it will definitely get updated as far as everybody. You can see we've got the special events in here. We'll be adding more. Uh, and then we've got our registration list. Shows you the folks who, who will be arriving and when. They've included their email address because when we have game signups, maybe you want to coordinate with somebody on this list that you'd like to uh, make sure you can meet up and play with. So that's why that email address is here. So you can go ahead and reach out to them and schedule some gaming. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, what's different this year about uh, Compass Games Expo is we're going to have some seminars for the first time. So that's going to be new. Um, that would be the main difference. We'll have our special events as always. Um, and it's just going to be great to get together for face-to-face -face gaming again. So it's been a long time and we're, we're counting with fingers crossed that everything will hold up for being able to meet up in Connecticut, uh, November 11th through the 15th. So please check it out on our website. I really appreciate you doing that. And, uh, yeah, we're excited about that. So next thing I want to do here is uh, really turn to our special guest and special announcement that we're going to have. So without further ado, what I'd like to do first is uh, let's let's introduce you to what this product is that we're going to be announcing for a pre-order tonight. So let me just go here for a moment to set the stage if I can. Just give me one moment here. I'm looking off screen to get it ready. So yes, yeah, so here's our uh, pre-order announcement uh, for tonight. It's Contact Now Red Eclipse. It's by Steve Overton. And uh, we're really excited to have this uh, pre-order announcement. Uh, you know, there's a lot of pre-orders we have to really make and get to. <laughs> a lot, a lot of, uh, I get a lot of great questions and reminders about, hey, I heard you're doing this. When are you going to announce uh, Beneath the Southern Cross or, or this other game? You know, when's it coming to pre-order? So, yeah, we've got a lot of pre-orders to get through. We're trying to, uh, trying to get them done. Uh, we've got a Big, big pipeline to go through still, but uh, for tonight, since you're stuck with me, I thought there'd be nothing better than to introduce you to Contact Now Red Eclipse. Before we get into the details of that game, however, uh, we do have our special guest for tonight, which is uh, Steve Overton. So let me go ahead here and bring uh, Steve into our stream so we can say hello to Steve. How are you doing tonight, Steve? Good. How are you doing, John? Great, great to see you. I'm a dog owner, lover myself. My dogs are in the next room. Otherwise, I'd have them on my lap for uh, for support. They're they're awesome. It's awesome having dogs. So thank you so much for being here. Like I said, it's been uh, long in the making to uh, to have a Red Eclipse uh, available uh, on pre order. We're very excited to have the uh, the launch uh, tonight. And uh, what I'm going to do here real quickly is. I want to first just share a little bit and introduce you to everybody, just your background before we get into the actual uh, game itself to talk about the game itself. So I'm going to ask the same usual questions everybody's used to me asking, but we haven't chatted before. So I want to ask you real quickly, where are you joining us from tonight, first of all? Uh, I'm from Odessa, Texas. Odessa, so that's big football country for Texas, high school football, I think, right? Is that it's Friday, Friday Night Lights? Football. Yes, it go. is Friday Night Lights. That's Very cool. cool. I haven't been down to Odessa yet. I'm in Plano, but I haven't had a chance. I think my wife has been down, but uh, very cool. Thanks for uh, thanks for being here tonight. And then uh, let's uh, talk a little bit about your introduction to the hobby. How did you uh, discover uh, wargaming? 
And when did that happen? Well, I was in high school and uh, sophomore in high school and I was doing modeling um, and a company that's pretty close to you, um, the squadron shop. And I ordered models out of there. And one time they had an, uh, an advertisement for war games that were on sale. And I bought three war games for $7 a piece back then. <laughs> Oh, bless my, my, my heart hurts, hit hurts hitting that, hearing that price. Do you remember what any of the games were? Can you remember what they could have yeah, been? Yeah, I bought um, Stalingrad oh. and D-Day and Africa oh. Corps, and the fourth oh. one was Panzer Blitz. Oh, man, you're hurt. That, this hurts, the pain. I can feel the pain. So that's a great introduction uh, to the hobby for sure. And then uh, how did you go down? Did you stick with board games? And just Have you done straight board games, or have you done any types of other gaming? Uh, well, I was... When I came out of the army, um, I got squad leader and played that and really liked that and yep, everybody cool. else and tactical gaming. Uh, my first scenarios that I ever made were for Panzer Blitz. So, um, so I did squad leader and, and was involved in ASL. And then I ended up buying a fire team from West End games by John Souther. Yeah. Yeah. And when I did, I liked so much of that, that I, contacted West End Games and said, look, I just came from Europe. I can do the British and the West Germans and the Czechs and the Poles. And they were like, oh, great, send it to us. So I put it all together and sent it to them. And about, I don't know, two or three weeks later, I get this mailing tube back with all my stuff in it and a nice little note that says, thanks a lot for your interest, Steve, but West End Games no longer sells war games. And, oh, and ouch. So, ouch. At that That's moment, the board war gaming community collapsed. I had three games I was working on with GDW, and uh, and they, they just all went away. So I moved over to computer games, combat mission mostly because I it was a pretty close uh, proximity of squad leader on the computer. So I was doing that, and I formed a group, and we did all kinds of things, and we were the first internet group to have over. 10,000 members was oh, wow. one of the ones that Gary Crockover put together uh, called the proving ground. And then the scenario depot too. And so we did all that. And, and one day I was talking to Gary about, yeah, we could do this board game too bad there. He goes, wait a minute. No, no board, board games are back. I'm like, no, Gary board, board games are not back. I, you know, I, I, well, he showed me Vassal, and lo and behold, <laughs> there you go. board war games were back. And so, I, long story short, my grandson and I got this game, um, which was a derivative of Fire Team. We pulled this out, and started playing it, and messing around with it. And after a long, extended uh, development time, uh, here it is. It's ready to be on pre-order. Yeah, that's nice. So it's interesting. So I heard a few things you said. Sounds like uh, you're we're definitely in the right swim lane for you. So you mentioned a lot of tactical games, like with squad leader, squad leader, and the others. So you definitely like that tactical squad level, which we're going to talk about Red Eclipse here in a moment. Your new it's actually a series, Contact Now series, but the first title is called Red Eclipse in the series. So obviously you're 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 sticking to what you love, which is that squad tactical level. And then uh, you've mentioned a lot about doing scenarios. So it sounds like you've, you, so you've done a lot of scenario or sen scenario generations for, for games in the past, it sounds like. I have. Um, in fact, the real reason that I continued to develop Fireteam with John Southard, actually, when I first started this, I contacted John and we talked a lot at first. And then I kind of went away from his, but I'm a scenario designer. I'm not really a game designer, mm -hmm. but I couldn't ever find the system out there that I wanted that would mm -hmm. allow me to make the scenarios that I was looking for. So sure. I ended up designing the game. That's awesome. And then I did want to share with everybody here. So let me share the screen just for a moment. Uh, we've got Red Eclipse still there, but uh, there is your Contact Now Red Eclipse Facebook group. You have nearly 500 members. Wow, that's a lot for just a dedicated game which hasn't been published yet. So congratulations uh, on this uh, group. I haven't checked how long this group has been in existence. Can you share, tell me a little bit how you started your Facebook group, how long that's been around? Because you've got a really impressive number of members here. We um, have been around for a couple of years. Wow. Three, pro three probably. 
And uh, I wasn't too happy with doing these. We ended up with a board game geek page. We ended up with a Facebook page because when you're having pages and blogs and well, you spend a lot of your time reporting what you're doing over there, which when you're reporting what you're doing, you're not doing anything but reporting what you're doing. So uh, yeah, <laughs> we've, that could be a vicious cycle. I guess we have had, I have a, I have a lot of followers from my computer uh, world. Okay. Well, okay. I did a hundred scenarios oh. for combat mission. I wow, did. Wow, a hundred. Wow. My, okay. my group that I started probably did closer to 250 scenarios for that one. And Jeez. then I got with um, Rob and Jim and we did uh, Flashpoint campaigns, Ready Clip. Uh, I'm sorry, Red, Red Storm. Mm -hmm. And I did for that original one, I did almost all the scenarios for that, did all the map. There was 40 maps that they had originally thought we were going to do four. And we, I ended up doing a map for every scenario because I believe that one of the ways to make this all work is content and content means maps, because if I can give you maps and I can give you counters, you can come up with scenarios. That's the way this all works. So like, and following the squad leader um, design yeah, yeah. in there, our maps are geomorphic. We have six maps and they're, they're geomorphic. So we have scenarios that use one map. We have scenarios that use all six maps. We have some in between, small, medium, large. But we also have, which is a little unique, each one of our maps is done in summer and winter. So if you want to play the battles in winter, you can use the winter maps. Well, let me do this before we jump ahead into the uh, describing the game. It uh, wouldn't be appropriate if I did that without having Shane uh, Shane as part of the, the discussion here. So Shane, yes. Shane's uh, our artist on the project. So Shane, it's uh, great to have you here. How are you doing this evening? Good. Hey, John, I see you. Great. So hey, those, that, those might know Shane already. Shane Logan's been on a previous Compass Live broadcast. Uh, talking about Fall of Tobruk, uh, yep. which is a game which is uh, off to the printers already. A beautiful looking game. And uh, we're now going to talk about how beautiful Contact Now Red Eclipse is looking. So let me do this. While I have you all here, let me uh, show the product page for everybody. Now, everybody can obviously reach the product page now, the pay later or the pay now, whatever option you prefer. But Shane, we're going to go through the graphics here in a moment, and okay. I want you to comment on those as the expert. But I just want to share with everybody here, we've got the background on the game. Uh, we're going to have uh, Steve's going to talk about how it's a series and what he has in mind for the series, what's coming next. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll break the tension now just so everybody knows. Yes, there's more than one scenario in the game. <laughs> and I'm joking because I'm joking because Steve's known for doing hundreds of scenarios for other games and this is his own design. So yes, there's gonna be more than one scenario in this uh, in Red Eclipse. But again, the information's all here, the description, we have a, uh, a, a longer description here, which I'm not gonna read because we're gonna talk to Steve about that here in a moment about the design aspects of the game. Uh, the components, yes, as Steve was just starting to mention, I'm going to show those here in a moment. I don't have all the components uh, on the website, but I have samples. So there's uh, six 11 by 17 inch geomorphic maps, so they can be you know matched and mated any way you want. One side is summer train, the other side's winter train. Uh, and we're going to show that here in a moment with some samples. Uh, we've got counters of really nice sizes. I love the counter sizes, three quarter inch and a full inch for counters. So we'll see and talk about that in a moment. We've got event cards. Uh, we've got a, a data, special data cards that are tarot size, oversized tarot cards that are the actual data behind the weapons, etc. And then a bunch of booklets, including examples of play booklet. So all in all, a very, very big, nice package. Uh, but let's do this. Let's start with the artwork first. I always like starting with the eye candy. So Shane, uh, why don't you, uh, can you tell us where you got this image from? Is this something you're able to um, find? That was just uh, just an uh, uh, image off the internet, and I just uh, uh, basically posterized it and did a couple other things to it. And yeah, and as, as people can see, it's, good. I like, I like the colors, I like, on it, especially I like how it red. Looks great. And by the way, the uh, time period here, just so everybody knows, you know, gosh, Cold War is such a hot topic right now. Absolutely hot topic. So the good news is this is West Germany in 1989. 
So to let everybody know this specific Red Eclipse title, I, I know we don't have a subtitle that gives you the location or the year, but this is Cold War era, you know, the war breaks out, Cold War breaks out, West Germany, Soviets invading West Germany in 1989. Summer or winter or both? You know, we got maps maps for both. So let's see uh, some of the other. Uh, so what, I, what I've picked here, and I'm, actually let me enlarge this, and Shane, you can speak to this, but okay. uh, I want to share with everybody here sort of a larger picture. This is a sample of one of the, one of the six maps uh, with some sample counters on it. Um, maybe you can describe a little bit about the train feel you're going for here. It looks very nice, very, very rich details. I could probably even zoom in more. Uh, as you can see the details, there we go. So everybody can see the details here. Maybe you can share us a little bit about your, your process of the artwork and what you were looking to do here. Oh, uh, it's just, uh, well, with any tactical game, you get to do a lot of texturing and a lot of, uh, a lot of effects. And there's a lot of, uh, hand-drawn stuff in there as well. And, uh, once you get the look and the elements and you can, uh, you can, uh, do the, run the maps off basically once you have the templates ready. And these are nice large counters. So again, the smallest counter is three quarter inch, and then the vehicles here are a full inch in size. So it's really going to be, uh, it's really going to look, uh, it's really going to stand out on the tabletops. Absolutely. So, so that is a a little preview of a summer map, I guess you could say. Because on the flip side, since there's six maps, uh, I think the next one is a sample winter map. So, and I'll zoom in here again for everybody. So, I want you to tell us a little bit about. How you have to change the train here so were there any shortcuts here were you able to i guess use the same building and 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 uh and tree symbols and hedge symbols and just yeah change well, one you, layer for snow yeah you basically uh well you have to have everything the same so you just have two sets so a set of winter trees and then you do uh different processes to make a winter version winter version summer version so everything's in the same place yep yeah, and, and oh, Fango, thank you. Tarot cards. Yeah, the tea's silent. Ah, for, yeah, that's, that's me not having my coffee. Sorry about that. Absolutely. Tarot cards. Yes, those nice big, nice big uh, tarot cards is what we're talking about. Uh, let's look at some more of the graphics here, uh, if we can. So that's looking at the map with some counters on it. I believe also, I think you mentioned the, the Russian counters, which we see here, the Soviet counters, they're going to be a little lighter shade of, uh, of that uh, color, right? A little yeah. lighter tan yeah. color, so it's not too dark. Yeah for contrasting. So that's good to know. Just let everybody know, you know, we're tweaking the graphics. Uh, what can, uh, and Steve, uh, Steve, won't you step in here for a moment? Could you tell us a little bit about uh, what we're seeing here as far as values, say of the infantry squads, what these numbers mean? Could you walk us through a little bit? Sure. In the upper right hand corner, you have the experience level of the unit. So the R, you, well, let's start with the one on the left. The G is for green, the R is for regular, and the V is for veteran. And there's tactical event cards mm -hmm. that allow you to raise or lower a unit's uh, experience level on the map with that card. So if that unit isn't, like, let's say we're in the middle. We've got the R7 right there. If I think, as a Soviet, I don't want him to be an R7 I want him to go down one, then I can play the card and he goes down from an R7 to a G6. Now the number itself, or is the as NATO, I can play an experience level up and I can take him from an R7 to a V8. Okay. The upper right hand corner is the value for their morale, so and their and also their experience level. Okay. So um, to to pass a morale check, the green counter would have to roll six or less, the regular seven or less, and the veteran eight or less. So as you go up in experience, the number goes higher. The next number down below that is their firepower. Okay. The number below that is the, the mid range is the range. So you okay. see the green can fire at three hexes, but the regular and the veterans fire at four hexes because the more experienced units have yeah. more experience. They, they're better at firing longer distance and their yeah. firepower goes up. Yep, and then so the bottom the one mm -hmm. is the bottom right hand corner is their movement. And again, the green mm -hmm. units mm -hmm. don't move as fast as regular and veteran units do. Yep. Yep. Definitely see that. Can you tell us a little bit here? I see the crew. We have some interesting, uh, boy, we have a lot of different values here. They got a lot going on. This looks pretty cool. Can you, uh, walk us through, gosh, maybe what the, maybe we'll start with the simple one, the crew markers. What are these numbers? <laughs> what do the crew markers mean? Okay. <laughs> well, first off, 
back up to the yeah hold that right there stop right there when you see the uh shane's artwork there's going to be a certain number of counters of, of graphics inside the counter so the asr unit has two guys in it that's yeah. your stacking limit that's a fire team three guys in there is a full squad okay. and then two other guys as a crew so when you get over here on this other side when you get to a uh, vehicle there's only one guy showing on there because that's all you're really going to see of that crew is okay. you're going to see the one guy above the turret or or where so yeah as you go further to the left you have a single guy over there with an uh, all the way past to martinez on the left there is an uh, he's got a golden one up in the upper left hand corner Yes, that is a utility leader that you can play a campaign scenario with because he doesn't have a name on it that you can interject yourself into the scenarios if you like by having these blank no name leaders that you can put yourself in there. But okay. that one that one right there is that's a single counter. So if you've got, for instance, three of these ASR G sixes over here, yep. that would be six. Yep. And that leader stack with them would make seven. Yep. And until you get to ten you're not overstacked. Okay. Got it. Got it. So that's what's on the, the scale. What's the, uh, what's the, what's the hex scale, uh, per hex 50 meters per hex. And it's, I think it's two minutes, uh, how many two, minutes? To, two to five minutes per turn, but they, the yeah. impulses vary. The turns are made up by of impulses, which are determined by the amount of leadership that you have on the map. Somebody had a question here for you. Uh, John Hong's joining us from Facebook tonight. Thanks for joining us, John. Is hey, this John. the same scale as your original game? I don't believe fire team was 50 meters. And the reason that I put it at 50 meters is that was because I've seen them at 40 meters and 80 meters and all this. And I'm like, 50 meters makes more sense. It's two hexes to a hundred meters. And you know, that just made sense to me. So I okay. picked the 50 meters. It's, I don't think it's the same scale as fire team. Okay. I don't think it is. Let's look at some more counters here. So tell us what we're all, oh, we got some individual weapons here. Oh, we have we heroes. Um, you can get a hero if you yeah. have a tactical event card in your hand and you roll a morale check with doubles gives you a hero. You can get heroes in vehicles or on there on infantry. We have individual weapon systems. There's the M203, which is a, a hybrid. Um, mm. And it shows the grenade launcher, which is in as a value in red. The the values on the counters and in the game are color coded. Yes. So the game comes with three dice: white, black, and red. Okay. And when you do um, anything with a die roll, the color that you're looking to match or add to or uh, beat or whatever, like on the M203, there's a five red. Yes, I see that. If I if I throw three dice and you throw three dice almost all the time for almost everything, mm -hmm. then I will use all three dice because that's a red number. So you use if it's a white number, you use only the white die. If it's okay. a black number, you use the white and the black die. And if it's a red number, you use all three. You also three. Oh, I see. So the color also pulls in these other colors based on that order. So red red's best. It pulls in the white and the black die with it. So that's, yes. that's great. Okay. And that's the same thing with the leaders and, and the fire teams and all the stuff that you saw up there earlier. They yep. all are color coded with that too. So if you do a morale check, it's a black number. So you use a black and a white die to resolve that. Nice, nice color here. You've got what I mean by color is a uh, narrative. You've got a medic, you've got snipers. Yeah. You've got, you, you talked about the uh, utility uh, earlier. Here's the cruise again. Uh, two individuals again. The hero. You mentioned the hero earlier. Uh, obviously, there's some special benefits with the hero. I see not one but two asterisks. One with a there, hexagon it, shape, and so there must yes. be a lot going on with the hero. The asterisk means if you can see that hero on the map, he can tell you what to do. Ah, interesting. Okay, communication. The others nice. have a have a number inside the golden hexagons or the okay. black one. They'll have a number in there. That means that you can tell people what to do within the range of that number. But a leader, if you can see that hero do his thing, like if he jumps up out of that building and runs across the road to attack, if you saw him do that, then he can activate you to do that same thing. Awesome. Let's look at the next. I think the next one will be a Russian counter sheet with, again, this color will be not quite as dark as you see here right now, everybody. Uh, Shane, by the way, just spectacular artwork. Uh, no, so these are the one inch counters. Shane, that's you know, correct. These are the larger counters. Is that correct? I'd like to 
I'd like to take a second here because, yep, yep. you know, you're talking about Shane's artwork and this is a great place right here to talk about not only Shane, but these. Oh yeah. The other artist. Yes. You have another artist involved the, in this project. The yeah. Tony Costa did yes. a bunch of, he's done game development on this game for years now and he helped with the artwork, but, but he's not the only one I'm, I'm pretty good at world war two, but I'm not as good at the modern stuff. So Tony, Costa is a tanker. Joe Stedman gave me one of the best um, examples of what I should do with the, with the rules. But I've got like John Southard was involved. Gary Crockover helped bring tactical event cards into the game. I mean, and I've got all these guys that have helped. Yeah, and that's awesome. Without all of that, we still wouldn't be here. Well, people so are I just wanted it. to say thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, I, I, uh, Tony, I, I was uh, I should have I was remiss in not mentioning Tony. And what I like about our audience is nobody's shy. Nobody pulls punches with feedback. So for for Shane, you know how how our customers are. We love being uh, very collaborative and getting feedback. So you got a little feedback from Tom Speech who's joining us on YouTube. So thanks for joining us, Tom. So appreciate it. But yeah, no people. Uh, yeah, artwork. Uh, very nice. Pre ordered. Uh, really nice to see uh, people really excited to have a uh, a tactical game. Probably the really exciting me, thing is we, we haven't talked about the series yet because there's going to be a lot more involved in the series. But uh, let's talk a uh, little bit, uh, Steve, about what the values on the vehicles mean. So if you can okay. walk us through what the values mean. Let's go through and, and tell Tom uh, about his old eyes. That's why we have three quarter inch and one inch counters, buddy, because of old eyes. Well, that's me. Because so, my because okay. my eyes are old like the rest of you. <laughs> that's, that's me. Okay, so what we have here is, if you can see, it's going to be on the map. So we don't really do a lot of intelligence on the map. Everything to do with this game is chaos related. I believe in that. You know, the plan only lasts until first contact. So after that, it's all everything and anything can happen. So these counters, the vehicle counters. <coughs> excuse me yeah, no problem no problem they uh they have on them what the enemy could see they could see that in in this particular case this tank can move let's take a t80bv right in the middle that tank can move now it's going to help the gamer because i don't want him to have to go to the to the game card every time mm -hmm. the data card so he yeah. can tell that he can move 17 it shows what the size modifier is. Is this a small, medium, or large vehicle? And it shows, does this vehicle weapon, is it in a turret or not? Okay. And that's what that black circle up, that, up there is all about, okay. is that's a turret. This is a turreted vehicle. Yep. Everything else is on a data card, and that's what that green and yellow tab indicates, that it's a data card, and you go to the T80BV data card, and it gives you all of the information about the defensive values at certain angles, the, the offensive firepower. Yeah, there's the data cards right there. And it shows you uh, in this particular one, the BMP2 has two weapon systems on it. And so we are showing you both of the weapon systems that this vehicle has and the capability. But the, the armor shows the hull and the turret if it has one. And again, um, you see that the the numbers um, in this particular case, you have black numbers and white numbers. Those black mm -hmm. numbers are actually white. Will okay, but it's hard to show. It's hard to show white numbers on white background. So I understand sure. what that's about. Sure. But so uh, oh, so if we're firing at you, let's just take the the thirty millimeter auto cannon AP. That's uh, the armor piercing value is a ten. If he was firing at himself and he hit the hull in the front. He would be firing at 10 against nine. You would just both roll a white die and add that to the, so the attacker would roll and let's say you got a four, he would add that to that 10, 14. And then the hull on a nine, if he even got a six, that's 15. Whichever one of them is higher wins. So okay. if the if the target is higher, he wins, you didn't kill him. You didn't hit him. If the, if the attack value is higher, then the unit loses and it, it would die. 
Let's do this. I want to show one more component and then I want to take a step back and talk about the system in general, sort of a high level picture, but there are tactical events. So there's the data cards I just showed. We just briefly touched upon that. That's going to cover those weapon systems, the vehicles, etc. But can you walk us through, Steve, can you explain to us what I think there's 50 tactical event cards for each side. So there's a total of 100 cards. Can there you walk are. us through? Could you walk us through uh, how these tactical event event cards come into play? I assume the, it's for chaos. A little bit of the, the chaos entire, factor. the entire um, series has twenty-eight tactical events, and those twenty-eight tactical events are set up according to the standard operating procedure for that type of military. So, and, and in this particular case, you'll see the tactical event cards also have icons on them that show can this card be used with infantry can it be used with armor um the binoculars show that it has to be leader activated and then it tells you right on the card what the special event is and ha yes. and the and the rules that govern it right there each one of the decks has 50 cards in it so let's just take the americans let's say the americans in this particular one have have six close air support cards okay and the soviets have two air support cards. So even mm -hmm. though they both have air support, the Americans rely on air support much more than the Soviets do. So in that particular case, we have set the military um, organization and what they, how they operate into those tactical event cards. Mm -hmm. So you can play, if you com comparing that to the command points, your leaders tell you how many command points you get in a turn. And that tells you how many, um, command point shits you will get to draw randomly between how many those are and their size and the tactical event cards. You can play any organization, any military organization without knowing how they uh, did their job because it's been set up that that's the way that they play. Right. Right. So in other words, you could go from playing the Soviets in the cold war in 1989 to the Japanese in on Guadalcanal in 1942, and you don't have to worry about, well, I don't know what the Japanese did or I don't know what the Soviets did because the game system has that built right into it. Let's do this. I, I'd really like to do this because I think we did a really good job introducing the components for the game. Uh, I think everybody has a really good idea, you know, what the different components are and what they do. But I'd like to take a step back or a bigger picture view. And uh, there was an excellent comment, Henry, over on YouTube saying, can you describe a little bit about some of the rules to this? So the game system in general, in other words, and I think I've got here an intro passage about the game. So at a very high level, Steve, can you give an introduction if you were in an elevator with somebody and had two minutes to explain how the game basically works, you know, how the design works? Uh, I think that'd be great just to just to give a quick pitch on the overall game. How, from how 19, flows. from 1989 to now, Contact Now has been developed. So it's been a long time, but I didn't want it to not be developed. And and every single pass we make through the rules, we make it more and more intuitive. And I taught a 12 year old boy to play this game in. Uh, the seven springs at the WBC. I taught him how to play it. He didn't see the rules. He didn't by the second turn, he was playing the game. He played the game three times and he beat me twice. So <laughs> the rules while they're <laughs> easy, while the to rules grasp, are like, easy to grasp rules. Yeah. They're like 40 pages, but 10 pages of that are me explaining to you how to do random chip draw. So it's yeah. the rules are not extensive. They're not deep. We have examples of play. Um, we have three sets of rules, actually. We have the World War II, the, what I call the hybrids, which is basically Vietnam where helicopters come in, and but they still have bolt-action rifles in some instances. And then the modern ones that have like heat-seeking uh, thermals and uh, sights and, and anti-tank guided missiles and all of that stuff. So we have a set of rules that governs three particular periods in there, probably about 30 years in each period. The rules are about 90% or more um, compatible with each other. There's only a few things that change. Um, the, the rules have so far proven to be intuitive. We haven't had, but when I, the biggest thing I got was from Joe Stedman when I was talking to him about hold down. I said, okay, 
I want to know, does the driver do the tank hold down or does the tank commander do the, do the hold down? Who decides? And he said, Steve, stop worrying about that. He said, let the men do their job and you just fight the fight. So now I automatically put the tank and hold down because that's what the crew is going to do. And I don't have to worry about that. Right. I don't have to worry about if they pick an armor piercing round to fire at a tank. The crew is going to do that. We don't have to go down sure. and do that level of management. And then uh, the system itself, though, looks like it's really focusing, uh, which I'm showing here on screen. So anybody can check this out. Uh, you mentioned the loop. You know, it's the observe, orient, orient decide, act loop. So it yes. looks like command looks like command control is a big part of this game as far as being able to take actions, husbanding your resources. There's tactical tactical event cards coming into play, which to me might be a little bit of that fog of war or chaos that can happen in the game with I imagine both sides can uh, intervene with card play. Uh, but but in general, let's say I'm playing a turn. Uh, could you mention how the impulses work or what what would what would happen in a typical turn if you could sort of walk us through? you know, the sequence or the decisions that players are going to have to make uh, during play, if that makes sense. Sure. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to check to see how many command points you get. So you're going to go with your leaders and you're going to find out um, with your leaders on the map. Infantry leaders all get one point. And then if they have a bonus, whatever's in that yellow gold hexagon, if there's a whatever that number is, gets added to it. So if I have three leaders, I get three command points and I got let's say three more bonus points. One guy's got a two, one guy's got a one that moves us up to six. I go over to the chart. I look on their U S chart for six. It tells me you get three twos. All right. So I take those three twos, put them off to the side. Soviet does the same thing. Okay. He get, he's going to get six, but instead of that, he's going to get two threes instead of three twos because the Soviets are much more regimented in how their military works and in, in, in issuing in the orders right they're not as and that's right yeah absolutely so, that's, so, so even that controls though the doctrine yeah it's it's set up on doctrine and even though you have the same number the u.s and the soviets have the same number of command points the they won't get the same number of activation chits to be put in for impulses gotcha. so that so that again takes into account that you can play the soviets and not know anything about them if you want to all right, so we do that. We put those in the in off to the side. Next thing we do is we're going to draw our, our tactical event cards, which is going to be four. We're generally speaking, four, and you can play those anytime during the turn because they'll be refurbished at the beginning of the next turn. So you'll always have four. You can play none or all four, and then we'll move to the action phase, which that's when you start drawing the chits out and you activate. So when I draw a chit, let's say I draw a, a two. The two for the let's we'll just go with the U.S. So the U.S. draws a two. He can activate either two individual units. Like if I have a machine gun with a, uh, a crew off in a building by itself, he can activate that with one of them. Okay. Or he can activate a leader and that leader can activate anybody and everybody that's in his bonus range, his his activation range. So if that if he has a one. That leader can activate everybody within in in a seven hex area in the gotcha. hex he's in and every hex. So one leader could activate literally um, 60, 70 uh, combat units on the map. One leader could. Uh, great question from Darren over on Facebook. Uh, can how how does the game play solitaire? I think we have a medium rating on it because I know there's some card play, which could be perhaps that's a semi hidden factor in, in how cards get played out by both sides. But could you explain uh, have there you is. a lot of experience? Yep. And um, I had Nate Rogers help me with that because he's one of the guys who play solitaire. Oh, Nate, Nate, the gimpy, the gimpy game. Yeah, Nate Rogers. that's yeah, right. The gimpy well. gamer. That's Nate, <laughs> Nate did a tremendous job with helping me with this. And we came up with a system that because how are you going to ambush yourself or whatever, you know, right. how right. are you going to, to play cards that you don't know? So here's the deal. The Russians have 50 cards and I'm playing the Americans when I move or whatever. And I'm thinking, okay, um, I don't want him to move that one. So I'm going to draw two cards from the uh, Russian deck. And in that Russian deck, those two cards are, if they can be played to stop me from moving, you can play it right then. If not, you discard those two cards. If I'm firing 
at you or the or the Russians firing, and he wants to see if he can add firepower to it. He draws two cards, and so whenever you get to a point where the AI should kick in, you yeah. draw two of the tactical event cards. Otherwise, you play the game just like you would normally. Okay, but you add that fog of war back into it, so you can't really. Um, not ambush yourself or not do some things because you don't know what yeah. those cards are in their hand, just like if I was playing you. I'm glad you came up with that wrinkle for solitaire play. I think everybody appreciates when uh, designers are able to work with others and with Nate. Sounds like you worked with Nate, had some good ideas there. So thanks, uh, thanks for doing that. David, who's joining us on YouTube uh, tonight, uh, is curious about what's a typical scenario length to play and finish. Uh, one mapper versus, let's say you put all six of those geomorphic maps together. They're, they're each 11 by 17. What's the uh, what's the play time from a one mapper scenario, say starting scenario to a full blown, say six mapper scenario? Probably one to three hours. It depends on the, well, what normally happens is you start off with a large number of command points because all your leaders on the board are fine. Well, when a leader breaks, they get a zero. So if you have a two leader, he would give you three command points, one for being a leader and two for his bonus. That same leader, if he breaks or gets pinned on the map or whatever, he becomes a zero. So he gives you one instead of three. As the combat moves forward, it starts to get less and less combat because the combat units break down, just like in a real firefight. When you first start a firefight, everybody's up and running and willing to go do but then people start to get pinned down and exhausted and they're not wanting to fight as much. And so as you go forward, the turns move faster and faster. But even then, a six map one, because you're checking lines of sight and thing, could take up to three hours for the whole six maps. Did we lose everybody or what? Uh oh. Oh, there, there we go. John, are you back or what? Hello. Hello. Yeah, I'm not hearing John's audio either. Yeah, John, your audio is out. Oh, okay, I fixed the problem. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, there you go. Yeah, you sorry. Go. I was I was silent because I was silent with shock with how impressed I am with the artwork in the system. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So uh, so some good questions. So John, who's joining us over uh, in the Philippines, he had some questions here. Uh, will there be any possums in the game? That's an inside joke. We're going to have to skip that one for now. But uh, production horizon on the game. Yeah, we're, uh, I can just uh, uh, comment here and Shane can chime in. So Shane's finishing up the artwork. Uh, what we want to do as a next step, as we do with every Compass project, this has a huge development cycle, many, many years back. It started in 89, the series. Uh, but what we want to do is it's been, you know, people involved have really know the system inside out. So we're going to bring in some uh, blind, let's call them blind proofers. So we want to bring in people that aren't familiar with the game system at all and maybe haven't played as many tactical games. We want them to proof the rules, review the rules, make sure they're comfortable with it. Let us know if there's any terms they're confused about. So we're going to still do some rules proofing, potential editing, just to make sure uh, it works for entire audience. Uh, and then in the meantime, Shane, you'll just be wrapping up uh, the uh, final artwork, whatever tweaks, yeah. the uh, can't, the shades of the of the Russians being a little lighter and things of that nature. And then, of course, yeah, the rules it's pretty much done, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so John, to your question, Production Horizon is uh, we would look to get the final proofing of the rules draft and then go to layout, get the layout done. I think we even have the layout of the rules actually preliminarily done already, so we can almost just proof those. So, yeah, we're moving fair, really quickly on this. It's pretty much a spot check at this point just on the rules because it's been played so much. Uh, we just want to make sure uh, for a newcomer, we want to make sure a newcomer's eyes uh, see if they can spot anything that we, we didn't catch because we're maybe we're too close to the project for those that have been involved uh, for so long. So uh, that's where we are with that. But let's do this. Uh, what I'd like to do, uh, Steve and Shane, uh, really appreciate all the work you're doing on this series and uh, the other artists involved as well, uh, obviously. 
But uh, sh uh, can you talk, Steve, a little bit about uh, this being a series? What comes after uh, Red Eclipse? What will be the next game uh, in the series? What are your plans for the future? I can say we're, I know you've got a lot of projects uh, sort of uh, in the pipeline. And our commitment is to look to get two box game, two box games of this series contact now a release per year. So doing two releases in the contact now series per year. So saying that, what would be the second game? What would be what would come after contact now Red Eclipse? What would be next? Well, we got to take care of the of the boss. And you know, Bill Thomas is a huge fan of Vietnam. So second game that we're going to release is going to be the United States Army in Vietnam, tactically. Third game in the series will be the Bundeswehr in back here in 1989. The game after that that I look forward to doing is going to be the U.S. Marines in Vietnam. And then the fifth game will be the Boer in 1989. That'll take care of both Vietnam and the NATO set of the part of the series in those five games right there. That's what we're looking at doing right now. Right. So I'd say of all our, I'd say of all the series games we have at Compass, this one has the the longest active runway I've ever seen of any, it's almost like a squad leader thing with, uh, but not with box games. It's like squad leader with their little action packs, with their scenario packets. And what you're talking about are full box games, lots of maps, counters, cards, data cards, scenarios. So we're talking about a lot of box products and it will be very happy doing two per year. And with all the scenarios, people should be very busy. And I think for Paper Wars, uh, the idea is for every Paper Wars issue, we'd like to, uh, and this is your idea, Steve, actually, uh, so you can share it with everybody what, what you're thinking of doing in terms of uh, gamer support in Paper Wars, each issue. Well, I'm a firm believer in content. And the more content you get, the better you are. So we're looking at doing uh, scenario packs like Huey, for instance, when we do the Marine, U.S. Marine, we'll do, may, we may do a Huey pack of 12 scenarios for just Huey. And, and I don't know how those will get out, whether it be through Compass or how that will work yet. But, you know, the whole process here is going to be um, we will support Paper Wars to uh, the full extent. We already have other game magazine that have contacted us and asked us for introduction, uh, introductory articles on, on the game series. And so we have a lot of uh, people that are looking at the game. And so what we are planning on doing is giving you as much support as we yeah. possibly can. Absolutely. That sounds great. And then Jeffrey's asking, is there a, uh, does the pre-order uh, order matter? Uh, no, to let you know, uh, you know, family run business sort of on a, you know, not tons of people admin wise. So we try to keep it simple. So what we do is we bunch up all the pre-orders. So when the game comes back, uh, what we do first is we look at all our pre-orders, which includes uh, Kickstarter orders as well. And all the direct orders, uh, whether it's Kickstarter or pre-order like you're doing now, those always get taken care of first. So, and you'll probably notice that from the Facebook groups we have or on social media, when people are posting on, say, Twitter or on Constant World Forum or Board Game Geek, people do pretty much receive the game around the same time. We try to ship. We basically package everything up that's direct at once, and it all goes out. But because uh, shipping takes different times to different geographic areas, you know, there's going to be a little scattered delivery here or there. You know, the ones that are closest to Connecticut get theirs like right away first, typically, uh, and then maybe West Coast might take a little bit longer or any uh, particular point. So great question, Jeffrey. But yeah, basically, you know, what we do is we take care of our direct order customers, obviously. Uh, you know, we value all orders, distributor orders, but obviously we want to take care of our direct customers first. So that's that's who, what we take care of first, just to let you know. But uh, thanks, thanks for your question, and thanks, everybody. Uh, we had a bunch of pre-orders come through. Um, let's see, Rally over on you, uh, you, uh, YouTube says it would be interesting to have an intro game of this in Paper War so people can get a taste of it. So uh, maybe that's something we can look at. It would require definitely two different counter sheets, but also, you know, there's game cards and our data cards typically involved. So I don't know if there's an introductory level way to do it without ownership of a previous game. But uh, yeah, I get your point about uh, an introduction to the game, especially because there's so many games in the series that we're looking to do. Uh, Dakota is asking, is there any plans for World War II, Steve, in, in the Contact Now series? Oh, yeah. The series covers from 1936 to 2040. 
Um, we have World War II broken into two halves because of the way the militaries work. So the Axis from 1936 to mid-1943 to Kursk, basically, are on the attack, and the Allies are on the defense. So you have more defender cards for the Allies, more attack cards for the Axis. And then after that, you have split where you have the the Allies are on the attack and the Axis is on the defense, and the cards split. So we have, for the Russian front, we have 1941 to 43, then 43 to 45. In, in the West, we have the 1940s, and then we have 44 to 45. We've got um, all of the World War II, the World counters – are done. World War II is covered and the counters are done already. So there you go. Uh, Henry, ask over on YouTube, uh, are you looking at Arab-Israeli conflict at all? We have the counters for the Arab-Israeli war done too. See, that's why, guys, we have so many games in this pipeline. Literally, if we do two per year, there's a lot of games, theoretically, that we could publish here. So uh, it's a, it's a, if you like the series, trust me, there's a lot we can do. Uh, Rick asks a great question over on YouTube as far as uh, can a personal leader, can a personal leader progress scenario from scenario? Is there any yes, connection? Yes, they would. That's they, the campaign. We plan on having a, a leader campaign where they can progress. And Joe's asking clarification on those event cards. So would you call would you call this a purely card driven game or card assisted? No, it's card game? assisted. You can take the cards and and set them off to the side. You don't have to play with them. But what they do is they give you uh, a fog of war and the special chrome that you can add to it, and with the special rules that go to it, not in the rule book, but right on the card. Perfect. And the, yeah, rules are right on the card. And does it add to chaos theory at all? Does it add some chaos with some of the yeah, cards? Oh, it, it does. Because you'll go, for instance, I get four cards and, and on turn one, I might not play any of my cards. And then on turn two, before when, when you pull a chit and it's like, oh, John's getting ready to move. So yeah. I can say, okay, stop. And I can play all four of my cards at any time during the action phase. And sometimes that means before you've even activated a unit on the map, I can play my cards or it's the last thing that happens on the activation Perfect. phase. Perfect. So Shane and Steve, we're going to put you to work here. Uh, these guys uh, are not shy in pulling punches. So we need a Western Desert, World War II. Uh, <laughs> Got them. Uh, we need that. We need Pacific, World War II. Got, Got it. Okay. We um, have not we, only the Pacific, but we have a full uh, slate for China and Burma, India as well. <laughs> okay. There we go. You probably, uh, somebody's probably just stopped typing. They were probably typing that. We also need Sino. <laughs> how about Sino Soviet 70s and 80s version? Mm, now, interesting. Because in the past I have been a historical scenario designer, and my scenarios have been for the most part. Um, about actual engagements. I have not gotten too much into the hypotheticals, but there's nothing stopping us from doing any of the hypotheticals. We can, I don't have the Chinese. They're the, the modern Chinese. I don't have the modern Russians. I do, but I don't have the modern Chinese, but usually by the time we do the research, it takes the most amount of information that it takes to put a, a military together is we've got to research the vehicles and make sure that we get them as close as we can. And we've got to figure out what kind of a, of an organization they do themselves with. So are they the American style, which is wide open and, and really fluid, or is it the Russian style where it's very regimented or somewhere in between? We've got to figure all that out. And once we do that, uh, we turn over the the graphics to Shane, and he makes the magic. There you go. Well, we yeah. got we got French we got French Indochina. Uh, we got to make sure that's covered. I, I don't know about Nazis on the moon, to be honest. I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, no Nazis case, on the moon. We got K Skeld in the pipeline, but that's on Earth. That's in America, so that's not really on the moon. That probably doesn't. Oh, exist. yeah, British Army in the Falklands got them too. Situation 13, uh, British Army in the Falklands. Uh, yep. <laughs> Bill versus Billy as leader counters. I guess we could do that. One would have to be a hero, so you have yep. to pick your hero. Yep. So are the maps uh, generic or uh, this is a good question. Are there like historical modules where the maps are literally of a certain area at a certain time, say World War II? No, or, yep. they are not. Be and I'll tell you why I don't mm -hmm. believe in historical maps at this level, because the hexes are 50 meters apart. Are, are 50 meters. If I have a building on one side of the road and a building on the other side of the road, 
how in the world can I make that historical when the road is 50 meters wide? I have yet to see a 50 meter wide road anywhere in the world. And I've been over quite a bit of it. Maybe in downtown Munich where it was six lanes going both ways might qualify for 50. But you can't do a historical map with 50 meter hexes and roads taking up 50 I, meters. I know where Craig's going. He, he, wants, he wants the streets of Stalingrad. He wants all of <laughs> Stalingrad factory works. 50 meters per hex. We need that for a game convention. We need well, on some more Craig, Compass Expo, the full Stalingrad, the full blown thing. You well, know. Craig, just so you know, we have done, where we have not done historical maps, we have done historical tactical event cards. So when we get to Stalingrad, part of your tactical event deck will be sewer movement. Oh, there we go. Sewer movement. Oh, I like that. Sewer movement event cards. There we go. I like that. Uh, paratroopers. 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 Yeah, we got them too. We got the paratroopers involved. Each of the games, and, and so far what we've talked about are full games. Each game comes with 15 scenarios. And the reason for that is I figure if you have a partner, you're each going to play the scenarios one time and move on. That's what my partner and I used to do with squad leader and ASL. So I figure 15 scenarios, that's 30 weeks. And there's 26 weeks and six months. And if we're doing two games a year, by the time you finish playing each one of our scenarios from both sides, there's a new game that's coming out ready for you to pick up and play. Mo, thanks for the humor. Good Lord. <laughs> what did Mo? All right. I did not see that coming. <laughs> oh, good oh, Lord. Oh, Nazis on the moon. <laughs> All right, Mo, you got the post <laughs> of the night. Congratulations, Mo. You got post of the night. Uh, yeah, Brian, Brian also gets a little bit of a humor award there. Uh, what about Arnhem? So could, uh, between, uh, you, Shane and Steve, could you come up with the counters and geomorphic maps where you could sort of feel like you've got the historical British forces and the Germans and, uh, whatever status the Germans were at that time. I, I don't know if you call them veteran status or conscripts at that point around Arnhem. I, I know they ran into that beast where they had to, we really could do, good. we could do an Arnhem scenario pack easily there's enough there's enough fighting in arnhem you could do 10 12 15 scenarios without any problems at all yeah i could, I could do whatever our steve wants me to do so okay great and then jeff has a quick question general question on another product enemy action ardennes yes the counters for enemy action ardennes are thicker because we have to reprint the counters and, and we have a new printer supplier for the counters that nice new thicker one with the shrink wrap counter so yes uh, Jeff, that is correct. The enemy action Ardennes counters are thicker. That is correct. Uh, well, this is exciting. So I think uh, we've got a lot of ideas. You've got a lot of people uh, interested in what's in the works already. Obviously, we're going to be starting here with Red Eclipse, uh, West Berlin, or I'm sorry, West Germany, rather, uh, 1989. But as you can see, we're going to go to Viet uh, Vietnam for the second title. So within one year, we'll have those two box games out. And then uh, in Paper Wars, we'll hopefully see perhaps a bonus scenario we can throw in uh, for you know whatever game's been released already. Uh, you know We might not be able to do an intro game just because I'm wondering about the cards and how to do that standalone would be very difficult. It would probably have to be you own the game already. So I know that doesn't really solve the problem as a introductory game if you don't own it yet. But we can definitely do uh, bonus scenarios and paper wars. We're doing expansions more and more with paper wars now that it's a uh, in-house magazine we're doing it with uh with devil boats there's an expansion in issue 99 issue 100 has an expansion for america bomber so i could definitely see you know we could do that have at least a scenario for a red eclipse to start uh in paper wars once the game's released so i'm, I'm really excited about that and then all these other ideas uh, that everybody has mentioned here. It uh, sounds like you're, you're going to be busy, both Shane and Steve, with uh, a bunch of uh, customer requests of what can be done next in the series. And we'll just have to figure out where do we go next as far as a, a release product. So uh, I'm really excited about this. I'm excited to see, uh, again, all the artists involved in the project, You know, great artists, great project teams. Uh, we're going to wrap this up. We're just going to do some spot checking, make sure uh, newcomers to the system uh, are good with the rules and everything to make sure we make it as easy as possible. I will mention there's an examples of play booklet being included in this game. So that's going to help a lot as well. I'm sure we'll definitely do. This is perfect, I think, uh, for Mo to consider as a learn to play series session. Uh, this is a nice tactical level flavor game. Gets completed in an hour. 
for a smaller scenario. So that's going to be working perfectly. So, um, so we're really excited about this. I'm so, and thank you, Shane, for dropping in uh, as well. I'm sorry, sorry for yeah, the short thanks, notice man. on you there. And, uh, and yeah, credits due to a lot of people here and, uh, congratulations, Steve, uh, for working and being committed to a project for so long since 89. Uh, we're, we're really excited to uh, get this first game out. And uh, hopefully it's going to be sooner rather than later because it looks like Shane's really pretty much wrapping up everything. Yeah. So uh, we're excited about the game. And I, I want to thank uh, everybody that's been on tonight uh, for uh, the early pre-orders, you know, seeing this right away, learning about it and committing to it so early. Check out the Facebook group, by the way. Uh, feel free to join the Facebook group. If you are on Facebook, you can look up Contact Now Red Eclipse. That's the name of the group help take it over 500 members pretty quickly. I'm sure we can post some, there'll be some updates posted there as we uh, move the game through print and production. So- uh, Well, and so John, we also have, um, just for one second here, we also have the ability to, to use the Facebook page for you guys to determine which games you wanna see next. Cause we'll do some polls or whatever over there that you sure. can vote on our Facebook page. Once we get the first five games out of the way, I don't have another, I don't have game number six already set. So you guys could decide what game number six is. There you go. Game number six. There's a, there's an opportunity right there. I, I love it. We will come up, they'll come up. We'll definitely come up. This group will come up with what they'd like to see for game number six. We just have to let them know what the first five are. I know it's, it's obviously Red Eclipse, Vietnam, and then there's going to be three more. So once they know what the th three others are, they'll be able to pick number six. Uh, ETA for publication, John, thanks for joining us on Facebook tonight. Uh, so there are cards involved. There's card production involved in this game. For every Compass product that involves cards, the cards are printed overseas, and that adds to the timeline to get those back as they all have to be you know bundled together uh on containers on vessels shipping overseas and you know that's a few months basically you know shipping's been a real pain in the butt lately uh to be honest with everything going on in the world so uh you know it takes a few months so eta we're definitely looking at you know like a release date we'd like to we want to get this out definitely first half of 2022 uh, it's going to be really hard to hit this year just because of the time for transports for the right. all the components to come in and that's slowed down all of our products have been slowed down with the uh, challenges with freight uh sea delivery uh these past few months uh, for sure so and i'll but, be demoing this at the con too at the compass con so. uh, thanks for mentioning that so at compass games expo absolutely yep St steve's going to be there demoing the game and uh uh, you'll have the game printed. I think you're working right now to get the components printed out real nicely. So uh, that's going to be great. You can see there's more requests coming in, Fallujah, M Mogadishu. So uh, just, uh, you know, the the uh, the system's perfect, you know, tactical level covering 46 and beyond. I'm sorry, 30, you said 36 and beyond. So gosh, the uh, endless variety of choices there at a tactical squad level. So, uh, so thank you again so much for joining us tonight, Shane. And Steve, oh, no. uh, great job again. Keep it up. And like I said, uh, we just got to get those freight companies moving quicker. But yeah, we're going to get this game out. Obviously, as as soon as we can, I'll put out a call for outside proofers here shortly as well, uh, just for some blind uh, readers of the system uh, for the first time. And uh, we'll get this thing wrapped up. Well, thanks, John. Thank Sounds you so much, good. guys. You take care. You bye, too. bye. Bye, guys. So again, that's just a wrap for uh, this evening. I hope again you're uh, you're excited about this uh, new release that we're uh, we've now announced for pre-order. Happy to have you here. Uh, again, we'll be joined again uh, by Bill Thomas uh, next week for our town hall, and actually that will be the night before. I depart for Consum World Expo in Tempe, Arizona. So hopefully by next Thursday with all the prep work I have to do for Consum World Expo, and I haven't done it and it's been like two years now. We've had a two year hiatus, so we're going back. Uh, hopefully I will still be awake, uh, not exhausted from uh, Expo prep, uh, which I'll be doing heavily between now and then, but we'll definitely look forward to our town hall. We can catch up with Bill Thomas on everything. Uh, thanks again to Mo for joining us tonight. Thanks for all the content contributors and all you do to support the hobby, not just for Compass, but the other publishers as well. All, all the uh, content you produce is wonderful, and we really appreciate that. So again, everybody, thank you so much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure to be with you, and I look forward to joining you again. Although, again, I might be a little exhausted. I might take a cohesion hit 
for uh, expo prep. But again, we'll have Bill and Billy Thomas uh, joining us next Thursday. So again, everybody have a good night, have a good weekend, and I will see you again soon. Take care and bye-bye.